If you're wondering why the product rule, can we please see a proof of that, uh, go to page 119 and read the proof on page 119. If you are willing to just accept this as a shortcut and say, all right, if he says that's the case, well, I'll believe it, and I don't need to see a proof, that's fine. But, but if, you, if you're a skeptic and you have to have proof before you believe anything, go to page 119. Not a degree, uh, no. Alex can do some level of computer programming since he taught it for a couple of years. And he actually did some work with computer programming and like stuff in college. I don't remember exactly what he did because I wasn't the one doing it. Uh, so you can ask him about his summer jobs at Villanova where he was working with like computer science, computer programming stuff. So he actually knows that stuff. I took a computer programming course here and then I took another one freshman year at Penn State because it was part of my required course load. And then I never did anything with it ever again. Not like me. I'm the dumb one. He also knows enough chemistry to have taught chemistry here for a little bit. I don't know if he'd want to teach AP chemistry. He doesn't know that amount of chemistry, but he taught it. He did enough to like be able to teach conceptual chemistry. He thought it would be a good idea to get lots of certifications to make himself look more attractive. But he uh, was at the schools when they were hiring. What he has discovered is that it means he's able to be uh, uh, abused more. <laughs> Because they can say, oh, we are short on math teachers. You're teaching math now. Oh, you're short on chemistry. You're teaching chemistry too. And then he stopped teaching like physics and chemistry and math and general science. And, uh, so. Meanwhile, I just got my certification in math. I was like, I have no interest in teaching like chemistry or other things. I'd be happy to teach history, but then I'd have to write essays. I'll pass. Grading people's writing and statistics was enough for me. And uh, well, the, the, the quality of writing sucks. So <laughs> did you know, I, my, my students a couple years ago didn't, but the verb to be is really useful. So like I would say like what is the mean or the median of the standard deviation and I would get back the mean would be five like no it, it, it wouldn't would be it is the mean is five it wouldn't would be five it is five but they like so many students substitute would for the verb is all over the place and I was like this is horrible writing this is I don't know how Rick does it. Like, he's amazing. He like corrects writing, and he like fixes like historical inaccuracies, and he gets it all back to you within like a week. And he's like, that guy's he's something else. Anyway, who here has Rick? No, but in the past you guys have. Okay, well, is he still like? Clockwork, you hand something in and it's back to you within like a couple days and it's like I, I try to do and it's a lot easier for me with math. I don't know how he does it with those essays. And there's like feedback on it.
Who? Who doesn't? Not everybody can be great. All right, Lucas, could you uh, turn the light back on, please? All right, so before we talk about quotient rule, let's work through a couple examples using the product rule. So, I had him back in the day when I was a little person like you guys. Yeah, he, like, I, this is how I know. Like, because I, so people, shut the door. So people who taught me that are still here, uh, Mr. Rigg, Mr. Miller, Mr. McCullough, Mrs. Kapolka, does she go by Kapolka or Rigg? Kapolka, okay. So back back when uh, I was a little person, it was she was Woods, but she's Kapolka now. She was in there. All right, so Kapolka. Um, what year did you graduate? 2006. Uh, Mrs. Hickman. Uh, Mrs. Silverman. Uh, Mrs. I, she had my little brother, and she was definitely here when I was a student, but I didn't have her. So all the English teachers I had have uh, moved on. Um, oh, and <laughs> by getting jobs elsewhere <laughs> or retiring. So like my freshman year, like he immediately retired. Uh, my sophomore, oh, Nora Zakreski's dad was my junior year uh, English teacher. Nora. Nora, yeah. So if you know Nora, uh, I taught, her dad taught me. Uh, yeah, that one. Oh. Uh, and then he got a job, I think, over at Strathaven. It was weird for like the first eight minutes, and then that was like, okay, now you're my colleague, whatever. <laughs> I have no, I had no trouble. Some people have a hard time; they grow up and like these adults they looked up to their whole lives, and now they have to like try to first name them. They can't, they can't make themselves call them by their first names. I guess I'm just rude. I had no issue doing that. Like, like, you are no longer Mr. Jackson. Now you're George. All right, fine. No big deal for me. Right? So. Uh, all of my history teachers have retired or gotten jobs elsewhere, except for Mr. Rigg. I think that's about it. Oh, Mr. Woolery, I had him too. And all my Spanish teachers have moved on. Hopefully not by dying, I don't know. All right, so uh, product rule. Um, you identify, first of all, oh, there are things getting multiplied. All right, so we've identified things getting multiplied. I like to label things. This is first, and this is second. And then product rule says take the derivative of one of them and multiply it to the original of the other, and then add the vice versa of that. So let's say h prime of x. What's the derivative of the first guy? So this guy's derivative is 3. This guy's derivative is 4x. So that's d first. Then that multiplies to the original second guy, which is what? 5 plus 4x. Then you add to that the original first, which is... x minus 2x squared, and then you multiply that by the derivative of the second. What's the derivative of the second guy? 4. Four. Ta-da! There's your power rule. Then, clean it up, because that's kind of a mess. And so you would now just distribute and combine like terms. So when you distribute this out, you have 15 plus 12x minus 20x minus 16x squared. <laughs> plus 12x minus 8x squared. And then you combine like terms. You've got a 15 with no friends, so if you stay the same. You've got a 12x plus a 12x minus a 20x, so that's plus 4x. And then a negative 16x squared and a negative 8x squared make negative 24x squared. And if you're neurotic and have to have terms going in order of exponent from biggest to smallest, just write it, turn it off. Um, now, you don't have to do product rule for number one. You could just as easily distribute out on the front end 
and then just do power rule right through. Um, and maybe that's easier. But this is product rule in, 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 in practice. Um, and there are situations where you have to use product rule, like in number two, where we, we can't just like distribute that out because you can't like times 3x squared to sine x and, and clean it up the way you could with number one. Uh, any comments or questions to follow that up? All right, number two, who are the two functions being multiplied? 3x squared and sine x. So label first and second, and then you jump in. So derivative of the first is what? 6x. And he, what is he multiplying? Sine x. He multiplies the original second as you see it. Then we add to that. Now what do we do with the first? You leave it alone. 3x squared. So you take the original first and you multiply that to cosine x, the derivative of the second. Then you could look at that and say, can I clean that up? Nope. And you're done. At most, you could maybe like pull out a GCF of like 3x. So if you're like, no, I have to do something to this. Okay, fine. GF, GCF is 3x. What's left behind from our first term? G sine x plus what's left, what's left over from the second term? x cosine x. So feel free to do that, but not necessary. Um, the advantage of doing this is if later on we say find out, I don't know, when the derivative is zero, because we want to know where the tangent line is horizontal, or we want to find out where they have a maximum or minimum, because that'll happen when the derivative is zero, um, then you would want to be able to factor it to start solving for x. But in terms of like getting the derivative, this is fine. Any follow-up questions with two? All right, three. How many terms do we have? Two terms. But within the first term, how many functions are there? Two. And what are those two functions doing? So we have to use product rule. So there are two terms. One term, two terms. You differentiate each term separately. To differentiate the first term, we're going to need product rule because that's 2x times cosine x. So we have the first times the second. Meanwhile, we'll just do the derivative of sine x and that'll kind of chill over here on its own, not with the 2x function. So working through this, to differentiate the first term, What's d first? Times plus 2x times negative sine x, right? So the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So all of that is derivative of the first term. Derivative of 2x cosine. Then over here, what's the derivative of sine x? Cosine x. So we have a minus cosine x. And why isn't it plus? Because forget the minus for a second. What's the derivative of sine? Cosine. What were we doing with the sine? Subtracting it. Therefore, we are subtracting cosine. If this were a minus cosine, then we would be subtracting a negative sign, and we would add that. How would you write a negative 
just say dy dx equals d dx, that's the derivative of the whole thing. So if you want to indicate I'm taking the derivative of this function, d dx indicates I'm doing a derivative, and then in brackets you put the thing you're going to differentiate. So then you would like do the derivative. So that's what you have to do here. Who would do this? You might be given this, not on physics, but like on a on a test like this, like you might be asked, hey, what's this thing? And that's the same as saying, here's this function differential. So then you got two cosine x, cool. 2x times negative sine, do not turn that into 2x minus sine x. That's going to be a temptation, is that you take this thing and kind of break it into two separate terms. This is 2x times negative sine x. That becomes a negative 2x times sine of x. And then we have this minus cosine x chilling on the end. Can we clean this up at all? Yeah, what can we combine this time? We got like terms. We have cosine x terms. We have a 2 cosine in the front and a minus 1 cosine in the back. So you can combine those and say that's a single cosine x minus 2x cosine x and simplify that. Um, any questions uh, with any parts of this? No point for us. Thank you. Uh, any questions with anything there that we just went through? So that's your product rule in action. And the big thing is identifying when to use it. In my AP class, for whatever reason, and I'm not entirely sure, of all the shortcuts, product rule has been the one that causes the most issues, not because they don't know how to do it. They absolutely do. Uh, but because they have the hardest time recognizing when it's appropriate to use product rule, and they often forget. Maybe because it's so easy to read right past multiplication without realizing it. You might look at 2x cosine x and not realize, oh, there's multiplication going on here between the 2x and the cosine x. So identifying, oh, this is a product rule situation. I'm multiplying two things involving x, and they both got to involve x. If it's like 2 times cosine x, we don't need product rule because the 2 is not like a separate function of x. But if you have 2x times cosine x, now it's a product rule problem. Um, that's pretty much it in terms of like what to watch out for at the moment. And I think we can return to the notes. Where is the note? There it is. And you guys can look at closure point. Yeah. Uh, I'll scroll in the direction that needs to be scrolled. So there's our quotient rule. Lucas, could you kill the back light switch again? Please. Thank you. All right, so there's your quotient rule. Quotient rule looks more complicated because it is a little more complicated. It's a little messier to use. Uh, the good news is it's really obvious when you need to use quotient rule because there's a fraction because that's a quotient. So if you see a fraction with x in the numerator and denominator, and you can't just simplify it away, then you're stuck using quotient rule. Um, if the denominator is multiple terms, you have to use quotient rule to take the derivative. You can't just use dividing. Uh, but if the denominator is a single term, you can maybe get away without using quotient rule. So quotient rule says that. If you want to try to remember it better, here's a little saying. Low D high minus high D low over low low. No. Yeah. And so low is the low part. D high is the derivative of the high part. Minus is minus. I is the high part. D low is the derivative of the low part. And then low low is the low part times the low part. Just drinking the bottom square. So just remember for quotient rule, low D high minus high D low over low low. Sing it to yourself every night before.
before bed, say it to yourself in the morning when you wake up, like little devotional calculus, beginning and end of the day, low to high minus high to low over low low. And you'll discover it's, it's fun to say. It's a good idea. Now, if low to high minus high to low over low low is too hard for you to remember, you could just say g times f prime minus f times g prime all over g squared, because that really rolls off the tongue nicely. Um, now here, because the numerator is subtraction, the order in which you do things really matters. So if you do high to low minus low to high over low low, you're wrong, because you're going to have the opposite of what you want. So uh, with product rule, the order doesn't matter, because when you add two things, who cares? With quotient rule, the order does matter up in the numerator, because when you subtract two things, yeah, that, that makes a difference. So uh, make sure low to high is coming first, and then minus high to low. So you guys can get that down. And again, if you don't believe me because you find me untrustworthy, go to page 121 and try to read through that proof and see if it makes sense to you. And if it does, good for you. Now you understand why the quotient rule is. And if you don't get it, then you'll just have to accept it on faith. Yes, Prince. Do do I count? As like when I'm doing stuff. <laughs> I've also got a song for the quadratic formula. And got a different song, but yes. Uh, and I've got a, a song for the slope. These are good songs I should sing to my kids at that time. I think I did do it for a little while, but uh, the songs go on cycles with kids. They get sick of them. It's like they don't want that one anymore. No more slope song, Daddy. Also, while we're at it, we may as well throw a couple trig derivatives at you. Uh, here are the remaining trig functions. So, derivative of tangent is secant squared. And the derivative of cotangent is cosecant squared. But thank you. And the derivative of secant is secant times tangent. And the derivative of cosecant is cosecant times cotangent, but negative. So these co-functions are somewhat related to each other, so that helps them to be sort of rememberable. Um, if a trig function does not start with the syllable co, its derivative is positive. If a trig function starts with the syllable co, its derivative is negative. So that's one thing that you can remember. Does it start co? Is it cosine, cosecant, or cotangent? If it is, the derivative is going to be something negative. If not, then the derivative is something positive. Uh, the other thing is if you can remember that tangent becomes secant squared, then the derivative of cotangent is the same thing but with a negative co in front of it. The same thing with secant. If you can remember secant, then you know cosecant because you just got to put a negative co in front of it as well. Same sort of thing with sine. So the derivative of sine is positive, cosine, and the derivative of cosine is negative, and then you take away the co in that case. So now you have all six of your trig functions uh, derivatives. Um, for tangent and cotangent and secant and cosecant, you could figure those out using quotient rule. Because you could think of sine, I'm sorry, of tangent as sine over cosine, for example, and then with sine over cosine, just do your quotient rule. So if you ever forget, you can do that and try to build back to secant squared. Uh, but I don't recommend it because it's time consuming and tedious and annoying and requires a trig identity. So I think it's a lot easier to just remember, all right, I mean, it's, it's worth my while just memorize tangent becomes secant squared by differential.
And if you don't believe me, page 123 is proof. And let's aim to get through two and a half more examples. Two and a half? Two and a half. Low is the denominator. This is this is low. And, and high is high. So it's the new No. It's it's like visually what's what's up and what's down. But I, I spelling out the word high as in up high too many letters, so I had to shorten it down to eight five. And, and low L O W is too far, is too much, so I had to shorten that too. So. So when I said two and a half examples, I think we're going to have to round that down to two. Sorry, guys. Yeah, it also be weird to go on like half a letter. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know how sometimes examples are like, here's example six, numbers A through F. Anybody need more time with the notes? All right. Lucas, would you uh, please turn the light back on? Thanks. You're so good at that. All right. We got this fraction 5x minus 2 over x squared plus 1. Since the denominator is more than one term, we have to do the quotient rule to differentiate this. If the derivative were only x squared, that would look like a lot like number 11e from your quiz. And you could then divide both things up here by x squared and have 5x to the negative 1 minus 2x to the negative 2 and do power rule. That would be easier. But the plus 1 ruins that and means we cannot just divide out this fraction and do power rule. We have to do quotient rule. So, label things. Who's high? Nobody says me. Right. So who's high? <laughs> right. And who's low? All right, we're all we're all a little bit low because we're stuck here the day before spring break, and we'd rather not be stuck here. So now you jump into it. Low to high. What's low? X squared plus one. What's d high? Five. What's minus? Everybody can do that one. All right. What's low D high minus high? What's high? See, it's helpful. 5x minus 2. What's D low? 2x. And then low low is easier to write as low squared, but funner to say is low low. So low low is the denominator times itself. So x squared plus 1 all squared. Any questions with setup? So know your low D high minus high D low over low low, and you can set this up. Then all you do is clean up the numerator, and probably it doesn't reduce the fraction. So you simplify the numerator, just distribute through, and see what you get. So when we distribute out the numerator, what's the first half of our numerator turn into? 
5x squared plus 5 minus what? 10x squared, and then be careful with signs here. What kind of 4x are we going to have? Positive, because we have a negative, negative 2 times 2x. So be careful with signs, especially in the second half of the numerator. Denominator is just chilling. There's really no good reason to distribute that out, so just let it be. Then continue to clean up the numerator, and what do we get? Negative 5x squared plus 4x plus 5. Denominator is just chilling. And maybe you can factor the numerator, but hopefully not. And in this case, I'm pretty sure it's not. So this is done. This is your derivative. And then you could go and like do stuff with it, like find the slope of this curve at various points all along the curve. Nice shot. Um, oh, that was you. I, I saw Lucas's hand up. I was like, ah, I was like, I'm much less impressed now. All right, Lucas. Um, oh, do we have to distribute that to the denominator? I would only distribute at the denominator if we were then going to do another derivative and take the second derivative. Because then you'd have to do quotient rule a second time, and it would be easier to do that if this is x to the fourth plus 2x squared plus 1. But if we're going to stop here and then maybe use it, or if we're only stopping with the first derivative, then leave it as low squared and don't worry about distributing that out. This is extra work that's unnecessary, and you know how we feel about that. Any other questions? All right. Now, this thing, we want to actually use the derivative to find eventually the equation of the tangent line to the curve at this special point. To write the equation of a tangent line, what things do we need? Slope and x, y coordinates. What do we have? We got x and y. We're lucky. All we need is slope. Now, we're not so lucky. That's the function we need. So in order to get slope, what's the first thing we do? Derivative. Because remember, slope m is going to be f prime of negative 1. So we've got to get f prime and then plug in negative 1. So this is our need. Let's do our quotient rule to find it. Before we do our quotient rule, what should we first do to this function? Specifically, the 1 over x. Can we just bump the x down here? Nope. Because these are separate terms. So rewrite this as 1x to the what power? Negative first power. So when you have like a fraction within the numerator and you're doing quotient rule, um, rewrite it the way you would if you were going to do power rule on just that term so that you can do power rule on that term. Because as you're doing the quotient rule and as you're doing product rule, you are also doing power rule as you do the derivative of the high part or the derivative of the low part itself. So that's a necessary first step, is rewrite 1 over x as 1x to the negative 1, and then you can go into power uh, quotient rule. Um, so low to high, what's low? What's d high? x to the negative 2. Right, so negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1, and then subtract 1 from that exponent. So that's d high. 3 goes poof because it's just a constant. Minus high, what's high? Three minus x to negative 1. Low d high minus high d low, what's d low? Just 1. Excellent. All over low low, x plus 5 whole squared. All right, distribute. What's x times x to the negative 2? x to the negative 1. What's 5 times x to the negative 2? 5 x to the negative 2. What's negative 3 times 1? Negative 3. What's negative negative x to the negative 1 times 1? So 
So so negative times a negative is positive x and negative one. Positive x and negative one times one is positive x and negative one. Or one times stuff is stuff. Then we should be negative and have negative three uh, positive x and negative one. Can you combine anything in the numerator? X and the negative ones. We have five x to the negative two plus two x to the negative one minus three. Do we like negative exponents? But is this problem really about the derivative? No, so we'll just live with it. And now we plug negative one. How would you uh, how would you evaluate that? You would see, oh. At least I'm not plugging in something weird like a 4. I'm only plugging in a negative, a negative 1. So when you go to do this, you might think of 5x to the negative 2 as 5 over x squared. And you might think of 2x to the negative 1 as 2 over x. And you might think of minus 3 as minus 3, which otherwise is positive. You wouldn't break it down. No, you wouldn't break it down. So, yeah. If you would, you'd be wrong. So if you want to get rid of these, multiply by fancy one of x squared over x squared. But I don't see a reason to do that because we're only worried about finding the slope. So just plug negative one here, and negative one squared is one, so you have five. And two over negative one is two, negative two. And minus three is minus three. So you end up with a slope of zero over 16. So the slope is 0, and so the line equation is y equals 1. So we'll come back to this after spring break. If you have a homework for 3.2.3a, have a good break.